we look into the eyes of our children, we see a vast landscape of limitless potential. We see eyes wide at the wonder of the world. We even tell them that they can be anything, that they can do anything to which they set their minds. We will help them when they fall and lift them up when they reach for the stars. We cheer them on at the fields of competition with the words, you can do it. We encourage them in school and inspire them to reach for greatness. Even as a society, we endeavor to have an educational environment that says to every child that there is no limit to who you can be and what you can achieve in this life. We revere the stories of Thomas Edison and Abraham Lincoln, men who rose to historical prominence from complete obscurity. We point to them and tell our children that they too can benefit mankind by their creative ability or could one day lead a nation in its greatest moment of crisis. But for much of our nation's history, there was a group of people who were given no such words of potential. Because of the color of their skin, they were bound to live a life of servitude and imprisonment. They were used and misused as nothing more than human property, instilling in them that they would never be more than what the sweat of their brow or the strength of their back could produce. They would never rise higher than what society afforded their ethnicity to be, a slave. In the land of the free, they were in bondage. But dotted along the timeline of history, there are those gleaming examples which show us that the potential of the human character cannot be bound by social class or cultural stigma. Names like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Booker T. Washington ring loud and familiar in our ears as those who rose above the racial prejudice that surrounded them. But one name, for the most part lost to our collective consciousness, is a thrilling example of the unbounded potential that lies not only in the human will and intellect, but in the divine strength supplied to the human heart. The story of Lot Carey is the story of when a black Virginia slave met a Jewish carpenter known to set captives free. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. In 1780, Lot Carey was born into slavery on a plantation some 30 miles south of Richmond, Virginia. Not much at all is known of his childhood and his early life. We do know that both of his parents showed a genuine belief in Christ. By this, we can conclude that despite growing up in the poverty-stricken conditions of plantation slavery, he would have been exposed to the most basic elements of the Christian faith at an early age. But that is no guarantee that a child will walk in the godly example of their parents. In 1804, he was sent to work as a common laborer at a tobacco warehouse in the city of Richmond, separating him from the godly influence of his parents. It was reported that he fell into a life of alcoholism and profanity. He was also described as becoming, quote, increasingly vicious, end quote, for two or three years after this move to Richmond. But it was in this time while Satan was endeavoring to drive him further into sin and rebellion against God that God was at work in the life of Lot Carey. And in his late 20s, this rebel against God was brought to faith in Jesus Christ. Carey's biographer, J.B. Taylor, said, quote, An immediate and remarkable change was discovered in his life. He whose tongue was wont to profane the name of the Most High was now taught to address him in accents of prayer and praise, end quote. His life experienced a radical transformation. He was baptized in 1807 and became a member of the First Baptist Church of Richmond, a prestigious church that from its inception opened its doors of membership to whites and blacks, slave and free. Not long after his conversion, 
he heard a sermon from his pastor, Elder John Courtney, about the conversation between Jesus Christ and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He became so fascinated by the rich truths in this passage that he became determined to read it for himself. You see, Lot Carey, like many slaves in the 19th century, was given no education. Not even the most rudimentary learning was passed on to these field hands. Carey acquired a copy of the New Testament and began to try to learn his letters in order to read. His intense desire to read caught the attention of Deacon William Crane, a white man in the church, and he began to teach Carey and a handful of other slaves to read on their own. It wasn't long before he was not only reading John chapter 3, but more and more passages from the New Testament and other books beside. With this learning came a burning desire to preach the gospel that had so radically changed his own life. He began to hold meetings among other slaves in various places around Richmond. His home church recognized his gift and encouraged him to continue the work that no doubt God had called him to. At this same time, he excelled at his work in a tobacco warehouse. He became known as a slave of impeccable character and trustworthiness. He had an aptitude for the management of the tobacco warehouse and was able to organize it with incredible accuracy and produce shipments in a timely manner with little to no error. For this, he was often rewarded by local merchants and his own master with small amounts of money. He was also permitted to take small bags of what was considered waste tobacco and sell them for his own profit. By 1813, he had saved enough money to purchase his own freedom and that of his two children from a wife that had passed away a few years earlier. For the sum of $850, which was for many an entire year's wage, he was allowed to walk away from his owner with children in hand, a free man. Carey now received a regular salary from the tobacco warehouse where he worked, a salary that was increasing year by year. Having a great innate business sense, he also invested in the tobacco trade, making his own purchases and shipping them for a good profit. By 1815, he had remarried and soon thereafter owned his own small farm outside of Richmond. He was held in high confidence by his employers, esteemed in the community at large, and universally loved by all that knew him. But the heart of Lot Carey did not reside in the possessions of this world, nor in all the pleasures and comforts that it afforded. He had a holy ambition, a burning desire to share the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. It was in the same time that he became aware of the missionary endeavors to reach the continent of his heritage, Africa. Lot Carey was instrumental in forming the Richmond African Missionary Society, a conduit through which contributions could be made toward missionaries going to the continent of Africa. But in his heart, this did not seem to be enough. He felt a solemn duty not only to give, but to go to this people, to carry to them the message of everlasting life. He had an earnest longing to share the gospel with what the Apostle Paul called his kindred according to the flesh. He had a decision to make. On one hand, he was free and independent, financially secure and well-respected. As a preacher, he was well-received by the black community and respected as a spiritual leader and known as a man of God. Africa was a place filled with life-threatening dangers. Various diseases took many lives every year there were so few resources there, and natives were not waiting with open arms to receive newcomers to their shores. But on the other hand, this was the land of his heritage, a people from whom he was a descendant, and this family was blinded to the saving power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and every day perished in darkness. It was about this time that Lot Carey was introduced to the American Colonization Society. The society was formed in response to a movement that attempted to enable 
former slaves to immigrate back to Africa and establish a colony there. By 1819, they had resettled many former slaves on the coast of West Africa. This introduction that Lot Carey came in contact with had several letters from freed slaves living in Sierra Leone, inviting others in America to join them. This was it. This was the opportunity for which Lot Carey had been waiting and praying for. The American Colonization Society would be the passage he needed to reach the African people with the gospel. The die was cast. The decision was made. He and his family would be missionaries to Africa. When someone questioned why he would leave a life of relative ease and comfort to go to a dangerous and even hostile distant shore, Kerry responded, quote, I am an African, and in this country, however meritorious my conduct and respectable my character, I cannot receive credit due to either. I wish to go to a country where I shall be estimated by my merits and not by my complexion. And I feel bound to labor for my suffering race, end quote. For the next several months, he applied himself in preparation for his departure to Africa. By 1821, he and his family were ready to leave for the coast of Liberia, West Africa. In January of that year, he was permitted to give a farewell address at the First Baptist Church of Richmond. His text was Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? With moving words and deep sincerity, he pointed his hearers to the greatness of the love of God, sending his own dear son for the likes of sinful men, cursed and doomed under the law of God. It was a powerful and passionate discourse that unfortunately was not well preserved. One quote from the close of the message has survived for our hearing. Kerry said, quote, I am about to leave you and expect to see your faces no more. I don't know what may befall me, whether I may find a grave in the ocean or among the savage men or more savage wild beasts on the coast of Africa. Nor am I anxious what may become of me. I feel it is my duty to go. And I very much fear that many of those who preach the gospel in this country will blush when the Savior calls them to give account for their labors in His cause. And He tells them, I commanded you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. At this point in the message, with the most thrilling emphasis, looking around at his audience, he exclaimed, The Savior may ask, Where have you been? What have you been doing? Have you endeavored to the utmost of your ability to fulfill the commands I gave you? Or have you sought your own gratification and your own ease, regardless of my commandments? End quote. After this message, he was ordained and set apart as a missionary to Africa. He subsequently sold his farm and all of his equipment and possessions that could not be taken with him and purchased passage for him, his wife, and children to set sail for Liberia, Africa. When word of his departure reached the tobacco warehouse owners, they immediately offered to increase his salary to $1,000 per year if he would only stay. This was an offer that he politely declined. After a long voyage, he and his family arrived safely in Africa on March the 13th, 1821. But upon arriving, he found himself in a situation of limbo that he had not anticipated. The purchase of a large tract of land for the establishment of the colony was delayed for almost a year. He, along with other colonists that came with him, would have to make do in Sierra Leone any way that they could. Although he received some missionary support from the Richmond African Missionary Society, he was forced to support himself at this time by learning a trade of coopering, the making of metal tubs and buckets. This was a time of great hardship and trial for him personally. His second wife, who was poor in health when they left for Africa, took a turn for the worse and died several weeks after their arrival. Although she was a believer and was no doubt in the arms of her Savior, Carrie was crushed. Living in a new and strange land, 
with the needs of his children surrounding him, and then to be suddenly alone with no earthly support, it was overwhelming. Had it not been for the strength of the Lord, he would have surely collapsed under these burdens. But God was faithful to preserve him through every trial. Finally, sometime in 1822, Cape Montserrado was purchased for the colony. The colonists began to forge a life there, calling the town Monrovia, after President James Monroe, which had supported the movement of colonization. Lot Carey played an influential role in the establishment of the town. Because of his unique skill and organizational abilities, he became a man that of necessity had to wear many hats. For the city of Monrovia, he not only served as a pastor and a missionary, but was also appointed health officer and government inspector. Carey threw himself into the development and the success of the colony. In some letters, he likened the colony to that of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, where the workers carried a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. The dangers of their endeavor were all around them. Cape Monserrado was a tract of land that jutted out into the Atlantic Ocean that held the potential of being easily cut off from the mainland by hostile tribes who bitterly opposed their settlement. Then there were slave trading ships that drifted past their shores, an ever-present threat to invade the town and carry them all back into slavery. In November and December of 1822, the settlement was attacked by natives with the goal of completely exterminating the colonists. Lot Carey was credited as the bravest of men when he rallied the broken forces of the colony to defend the city against an attack of 1,500 savages and prevailed. Through his lifetime, Lot Carey had become very adept at aiding the sick. Maybe it was from the care that he had given to his first wife, where a doctor was not an option for a slave, or the care of his children or even his second wife. Whatever the reason, in the extreme condition of this fragile colony, Carey was looked to as a physician, although he had never had any formal training as such. The weight of responsibility as a physician became greater and greater. Immigrants from the United States were especially susceptible to what is called the African fever. Carey, as a keen observer, had watched various physicians come through the colony in the early years of its existence and learned quite a bit about treating various diseases. This, topped with his experience and good sense, made him essential to the livelihood of the colony. In February 1824, the ship Cyrus landed, bringing 105 immigrants from the U.S. to Monrovia. All were in good health when they landed, but within four weeks, every one of them came down with illness. Lot Carey was called upon to do all that he could to nurse the newcomers back to health, and with the exception of a few, the whole group recovered. This role as a physician was so indispensable that on several occasions where he had purpose to travel home back to the States to give report of his work, he was forced to stay in Africa because of medical emergencies. At one point, Lot Carey became somewhat of a diplomat or a statesman in the early days of the colony, there were in general great sufferings due to lack of medical supplies, scarcity of food, and environmental exposure that brought the colonists to be at odds with the governor of the colony, Jehudi Ashman. This caused a total breakdown of law and order in this small community. Kerry found himself compelled by the people of the colony to relay their grievances to the governor and was instrumental in quelling the uprising. It is important to remember that above all he did and achieved in the establishment of this African colony, his supreme desire was still that which brought him to the dark continent. It was the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Immediately upon his arrival to Africa, he organized the Providence Baptist Church over which he was the pastor. This church consisted of other immigrants to the colony from the U.S., but also other African slaves that had been rescued from slave ships. All through the work and labor, through all the sickness and strife, Lot Carey persisted in teaching and preaching the Bible at Providence Baptist Church. 
He also endeavored to reach out to the native villages that surrounded Monrovia as well. Not at first, of course. The natives didn't trust these settlers and were hostile towards them. But after a few years, relations warmed, and Lot Carey worked to establish schools for tribal children to come and to learn to read. It wasn't long before local tribesmen were bringing their children for Lot Carey to teach. His letters to the African Missionary Society back home were filled with pleas for more supplies, school books, and clothing for children. Much of the supply for the two schools he directed and the compensation for the teachers working there came from his own pocket. In one of his letters, he spoke of the delight that he had in these children. Quote, You must know that it is a source of much consolation to me to hear the word of God read by these native sons of Ham who a few months ago were howling in the devil's bush, end quote. The work he had done among these children opened the heart to many of the indigenous people. Year by year, the church grew. It was not uncommon to find the church filled with not only immigrants from the U.S. and rescued slaves from other parts of Africa, but also members of the local tribesmen converted from heathenism. By 1825, the heart's desire of Lot Carey was coming to pass. God was using him to reach the lost souls of Africa, sometimes in the most unusual ways. On Sunday morning in March of 1825, a strange face arrived at Providence Baptist Church. He was a native from the area that insisted on telling his story. About three years earlier, this young man, who referred to himself as John, was sent to Sierra Leone by his father to learn English. While he was there, he had the opportunity to attend church where God began to work in this man's heart. This is his account in his own words. Quote, When me be in Sierra Leone, me see all men go to church house. Me go too. Me be very bad man too. Suppose a man cuss me. Me cuss him too. Suppose a man fight me. Me fight him too. Well, me go to church house. The man speak and one word catch my heart. I go to home, and my heart be very heavy, and trouble me till night time come. Me fear I can't go to bed for sleep. My heart trouble me so. Something tell me, go pray to God. Me fall down to pray. No, me heart be too bad. I think so, I going to die now. Suppose I die, I go to hell. Me be very bad man, pass all other man. God be angry with me, soon I die. All the time my heart trouble me. All day, all night, me can't sleep. By and by, my heart grow too big and heavy. Think tonight me die. My heart be so big, me fall down this time. And now me can pray. Me say, Lord, have mercy on me. Then light come into my heart. Make me glad. Make me light. Make me love the Son of God. Make me love everybody. End quote. It wasn't long after that John was called back home. With no Bible and no instruction, he was left only with prayer to God to further his newfound faith. A few years later, men from Carey's church were making their way up to Grand Cape Mount and became lost. The waves carried his boat to shore where he encountered a native man that was very gracious and helped him with supplies and guidance. The man wanted to give the native something in return for his kindness. The only thing the native wanted was a New Testament Bible, which the man just happened to have in his possession. The native was John himself. After reading his Bible, he realized he needed to be baptized, and he made the 80-mile trip to Monrovia so that Lot Carey could perform the baptism. In a letter to a friend, Carey described the day, quote, After preaching in the morning, I baptized the native man John and after preaching in the afternoon, we had the honor to break bread in the house of God with our newly arrived brethren from America and our newly baptized brother. I need not tell you, for you know it was a day of joy and gladness. The church made up a contribution and neatly dressed our heathen brother John and gave him an extra suit of clothes and gave him 14 bars, and he went on his way rejoicing. We also gave him three Bibles and two hymn books. End quote. One bushman at a time, Lot Carey was reaching Africa. In September 1828, 
the governor, Jehudi Ashman, became ill. His prognosis was not good. On his deathbed, having the greatest respect and confidence in his ability and integrity, Ashman urged that Lot Carey be permanently appointed to conduct the affairs of the colony as governor. And in obedience to his instructions, Lot Carey was appointed governor of the colony of Monrovia in 1828. But his role as the leader of the colony was short-lived. In late October 1828, a neighboring town was robbed by natives and many of its inhabitants were abducted into a slave trading ship waiting just off the coast. When Carey heard of the attack, he sent a message of warning to the vessel not to approach Monrovia, for they were armed and capable of defending themselves. But the message was intercepted by local natives and never reached the slave trading ship. Taking the lack of response as a threat of attack, Carey called the colonists to prepare for a defense of their homes. On November the 8th, Lot Carey, along with seven other men, were in a munitions room making gun cartridges when a candle was accidentally overturned, igniting some loose gunpowder, causing a massive explosion. Six men died of their injuries the following day, while another man in Carey lingered a day more. Lot Carey died on November 10th, 1828. Imagine with me a nine-year-old slave child working in the tobacco field south of Richmond, Virginia. He stops for a moment to catch his breath and wipe his sweaty brow, hoping that his master doesn't see him. He looks up at the sky and wonders, is this all my life will be? An endless row of tobacco. The silent skies gave no response. For if the Lord himself were to have told the little boy that one day he would be a landowner and a businessman, that he would become a preacher of the good news of the gospel, that he would carry the gospel to the other side of the world, that he would be employed as a physician saving the lives of hundreds of people, that he would be a government official, a school administrator and educator, that he would be a warrior defending his home from enemy attack, that he would be the governor of a colony and that he would be the inspiration for a mission agency that would continue his dream of reaching the world for Jesus Christ for nearly 200 years? Well, frankly, he would have never believed it. What God would do in and through the life of Lot Carey proves to us what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippian church. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Bonnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash ForgottenPodcast. Every month, two new episodes of Forgotten are released publicly, but in the off weeks, I do produce additional episodes called Forgotten Glimpses. These are episodes with the same encouraging and inspiring stories, the same production quality, only a little shorter. These are available through Patreon, a safe and secure website that allows people to support individual creativity. For just $5 a month, you can help support the production costs of this podcast and get more forgotten in your life. Just go over to ForgottenPodcast.com slash support for more information. Forgotten is also available on various podcasting apps such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Downcast. Be sure to stop into iTunes and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening.